Hey everyone, the actions, opinions, and viewpoints expressed in this episode are solely those of the participants. They do not necessarily reflect my opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints as a labor and delivery nurse. Hello, Incredible Moms. This is Crystal Evaristo with the Incredible Moms podcast, where we discuss getting pregnant, being pregnant, having babies, being a mom, and so much more. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey everyone, today I am so excited to have this very special guest on. Her name is Samantha St. Louis. She is the founder and CEO of Bee Baby. Bee Baby is a nursing consultation service that offers highly customized programs in sleep training, breastfeeding, fertility, and childbirth education. Bee Baby also includes Bee Baby Family Membership, a platform where parents get access to a huge on-demand library of video courses a community to ask questions to their expert panel of physicians, nurses, psychologists, osteopaths, speech-language therapists, and more. Weekly webinars and unlimited support via email and phone. Basically, the village we've all been waiting for. You'll be able to check out the Bee Baby Red Tent event that they're hosting in May for the opening of the platform. I'll attach the link on Instagram for anyone who'd like to attend that. You can join their Facebook page and gain access to free seminars the next of which will be March 1st. Stay tuned to the end of Samantha's birth story to hear all about Bee Baby and the wonderful things they offer. Hello. Hello, my name is Samantha St. Louis. Uh, I am a registered nurse clinician and um, I specialize in all care that surrounds uh, parenthood and motherhood. So uh, I work in fertility, pregnancy, childbirth, and offer specialized consultancy in breastfeeding and sleep training as well uh, for infants all the way to the age of five. And um, I am the founder and CEO of Be Baby, so the company through which we uh, offer all of these uh, services. And I'm also the mother of three under three myself. Um, so I'm intimately uh knowledgeable about, you know, what parents face and the difficulties they have and the types of support that they like to have. And a very busy mom, I'm sure. (laughs) Very busy, yes. (laughs) Well, it's so nice to meet you. I'm so happy to have you on just to hear your story and hear about everything that you do. My first two children, I was lucky enough that I lived fairly close to uh, a midwifery birthing center. And where I live, the uh, the, uh, midwives are not allowed to work privately. And so they absolutely have to work associated with one of their uh, birthing centers. So if you're out of zone, then you can't have access to a midwife. Um, And we do not have, you know, other types of licensing for midwives around here. So it's really, you know, the birthing center midwives or nothing at all. And uh, so for my first two, I was lucky enough and I had uh, water births with two wonderful midwives. And Um, they introduced me to the concept of a hand-free birth on both occasions. So um, I felt incredibly empowered after each birth. Uh, They both birth brought me to make big and important decisions and make uh, large changes in my life afterwards. I had my first two children two months apart, so uh, 12 months apart, sorry, so very close together. And then when my second was six months old, I got pregnant with my third. So there's 15 months between uh, them. So 27 months in total for for three children. And for my third pregnancy, we actually moved. So we moved like into the boonies, into the woods, very, very far away. We're three hours away from uh, the nearest city per se. And uh, where we live now, there are no birthing centers. There's a tiny little hospital only. Um, And this tiny little hospital has not the best labor and delivery um, center within it. They do not have a great reputation. They are very inexperienced with natural birth. And by inexperienced, I mean they just don't have any. Um, so when I moved here, well, I signed up for the labor and delivery ward here thinking I really didn't have, uh, any other option. And, uh, 
I went to my appointments and I tried to discuss with them. I even offered to bring in my own birthing pool and my own Doppler um, to introduce them to the concept of natural birth. And one of them was really on board. But the way that it works is there are four physicians. None of them are um, obstetricians. Um, and you never actually know who you fall on. So every appointment is a different one. And for birth, you really don't know which one you'll have. So if you want to propose something new and different, they all have to agree to it. And although one or maybe even two were really, really interested in um, doing a natural water birth, two others were really not. Um, and they responded to me that they were not trained for a water birth. Uh, and what I told them was, well, you don't need to be trained for a water birth. I'm, I'm the one giving birth. Right. <laughs> <It's> really, <laughs> and they're not an obstetrician, so they're really not trained at all in this. No, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I, you know, there's a Doppler I got. I can give you my Doppler if you need it, if you don't happen to have one. Um, beyond that, I mean, I refuse cervical checks. So being in the water or not, it's really not going to change much for you. Um, <laughs> considering I, you know, I don't take the epidural or anything and um, I catch my own baby. So all you really need to do is, is sit there and, and take notes. Um, <laughs> but they were really not on board to it. So I thought, okay, fine, I'll have a land birth. I'm not super excited about that because I do love my water, but, you know, I'm going to be flexible. And um, as my pre pregnancy progressed and I went to more appointments, I started talking about other things like uh, delayed cord clamping. And uh, at some point, one of them said, oh, yeah, we can do delayed cord clamping. I mean, it's not something that people ask around here, but we could do 90 seconds. I said, what do you mean 90 seconds? That's not delayed. And he's like, well, yeah, it's delayed. I said, that's the time you need to turn around, grab a clamp, put it on it, and then cut. But that's not delayed. That's immediate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 90 seconds, really? Um, so then I explained, you know, what I actually meant by delayed cord clamping and went on to explain that um, I do not... Uh, I don't let people, you know, tug and and pull on on my uh, on the umbilical cord, nor do I let them push down on my uterus or give me uh, pitocin shots right off the bat. You know, I I usually birth my placenta, you know, on my own using gravity, and I leave the cord attached <laughs> during that time. And they were looking at me like I had three heads. Um, and then, you know, eventually one of them told me when I was, I think I was 34 weeks pregnant at that time. And he said, you know, you're not going to get a medal for having a natural birth. Oh. And I looked at him and I said, well, thank goodness. That's not why I do it. Right. You know, I, I've never known any woman to choose to, to do natural birth because she was hoping for congratulations or, or, or a medal. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I went home after that and I started having severe insomnia. I was not sleeping. I was up until 3 a.m. You know, every night I was, instead of becoming excited and looking forward to birth like I usually do around 34 weeks, I was just extremely anxious and, and scared of what this birth is, was going to be like. Um, they were telling me that, you know, for them, I had to be on my back. Um, on the table with my legs up in stirrups. I have never, ever given birth on my back. I have no interest whatsoever. Um, and, you know, that they they do perform episiotomies for X, Y, and Z. And the reasons they were giving were not, you know, following um, the most modern recommendations for, for them, et cetera. So I was getting very nervous and I, I I had to find another option, but I didn't think there were any. But eventually I just signed up for the midwifery birthing center that was three hours away from my house, thinking, you know, I mean, worst case, I'll give birth in the car on my way. It's not ideal, but it's, it's better than than having some man between my legs telling me how to give birth. And then cutting you. <laughs> and cutting me Jeez. potentially. I, yeah. I even got mad once and I said, you know, my rule is if you cut me, I get to cut you, <laughs> you know, so you, you sure you want to go there. Um, I, I signed up for the midwife and I did the three hour drive to go see her and then the three hour drive to come back. And I did it 
uh, twice or thrice. And um, on the last time, I was like, this is ridiculous. Ridiculous. It's so far away. And for two hours of that three hour drive, I have no service. And it's a long, windy road along a mountain where you can't stop either. So I thought to myself, my last birth was five hours. And I only really realized that I was in true labor maybe an hour and a half before I gave birth. So I thought the chances of me giving birth on that road within the no service zone is pretty high. Um, And because of COVID, I didn't have the choice to just maybe rent an Airbnb or something close to the birthing center for the week before I I, I usually go into labor so that I would be a little bit closer. I started scouring online and and looking at uh, a lot of people posts and commenting on posts about, you know, birth and in COVID times, et cetera. And free birth kept coming up, but I thought free birth was illegal. So I thought that if I had a free birth, I was going to get into trouble. And at some point I actually commented that under someone who was suggesting a free birth to to, uh, another poster, I said, I thought it was illegal in Quebec to have a free birth. And she messaged me and she said, no, no, it's not. And she uh, told me, you know, all about it and how it's actually very legal. You're allowed to birth wherever you want with whomever you want. And nobody has any say about it. Um, And then she put me into contact with a few people who have had free births. I joined a whole bunch of free birth uh, groups uh, on Facebook. I started discussing with a few midwives online about the possibility of a free birth and I started getting very educated about how to get ready for a free birth and um, all of a sudden I started being excited again about the prospect of of giving birth and uh, but being a nurse you are kind of trained to prepare the for the worst exactly yeah so it makes it I guess a little bit harder to fully commit to it so what I thought is, you know what, I'm going to get everything I need ready at home for a free birth, but I'm also going to pack a small luggage to go to the birthing center or the hospital. And when I go into labor, depending on how I feel about it, how fast my labor seems to be progressing, I will make the decision on the spot, but I will be ready regardless. You know, if it's a free birth. I'll be properly educated. I'll have everything that I need. Um, If it's the birthing center, my bag is packed and I'm ready to go. And if it's too fast, but I'm not feeling the free birth, I can just head to the hospital either way. And um, I actually discussed with my midwife who was doing my care, you know, if if my labor starts really, really fast and I just know that I'm not going to make it to the birthing center, I'm not going to go to this tiny little hospital. I'm just going to stay home. And... um, she told me indirectly that I was making the right choice, you know, that in, in my shoes, she would do exactly the same thing. So she was supportive of my freedom of choice, which was just fantastic. And so, um, at 39 weeks and a few days, I can't recall, I started having contractions in the evening and they started ramping up and I took a bath and they kept ramping up and I thought, okay, this is it. And I went outside on my porch and I was dancing with music and I thought today's the day, but they weren't getting stronger after a while. So I decided to go to bed finally at like two in the morning and my contractions died off. Okay, fine. So the next day after putting my kids to bed, same thing happens. Um, Contractions start ramping up, et cetera. And I thought, okay, let me just go to bed uh, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night in full-blown labor. And I did not. (laughs) So this goes on for like four days. And um, on the fifth day, Around 5.30 p.m., I have small little contractions starting, but I'm like, yeah, right. You know, they're not, they're not strong. It's just not going to happen yet. I'll know when it happens, but it's, it's not tonight. But I did go in and take a warm bath just to make sure. And the contractions got weaker and they 
started spreading apart, which usually means that you're not, you know, in labor quite yet. It's probably just prodromal labor. So I got out and I had dinner and uh, I figured it's not for today, but it, you know, must be coming. It must be soon. And then after dinner, I went to the bathroom and at some point for some odd reason, I guess instinctually, I turned around and I sat facing the back of the toilet, which is a very common position that women will take in labor if you let them move around freely. And I started moaning a little bit and my husband came into the bathroom and he said, should I fill the birthing tub? I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not in labor. I just, you know, the prodromal labor has been going on for four days. So I'm, I guess I'm a little sore, you know? So I eventually got out of the bathroom and I, I decided to go to bed. But when I got into my, um, our, our, our bedroom, um, my husband had closed the lights. He had opened uh, cute little decorative twinkly lights that we had set on the wall just in case we did have a free birth. He had covered our bed with pillows. Um, he had put a little bit of music on and he was laying on the bed waiting for me because I guess that he, although I told him I wasn't in labor, he, he knew yeah. before I did. <laughs> That's so sweet. And so sweet. And um, I got into bed and we started cuddling and I was working through my contractions that weren't, you know, super strong yet, but I never discount a contraction. You know, if it's <laughs> working on my cervix, it's good and I will welcome it. But at some point I started feeling warm liquid going down my leg and sure enough, there was a little bit of blood. So I told my husband, okay, now I'm dilating for real. So go ahead and, and, and fill the, the birthing pool because I had this feeling during my entire pregnancy and at that point even stronger that it was going to be a very, very short labor. So it was 9.30 p.m. I think when I told him to fill the tub and I headed to our bathroom in the meantime and I lost my entire mucus plug in one shot. Oh, wow. So I told them... He looked at me and he said, well, I guess we're, we're staying home, right? And I said, yes, we are. <laughs> we're not going anywhere. I'm way too comfortable. I'm happy. Uh, I'm, I'm in my little love cocoon. Our kids are sleeping. Um, the, you know, he's filling up this nice uh, birthing pool. There's the little lights and everything. I have zero interest in going to the hospital because there's no way in my head at that point that I'm going to make it to the birthing center anyways. Uh, because the contractions, once I went to, to the toilet, actually ramped up really fast. So I got into the birthing tub and uh, within minutes, instead of being quiet through my contractions, I started growling at my hospital. <laughs> <laughs> which usually means for me that um, I'm very close to being fully dilated. <laughs> yeah, it's about that time. <laughs> yeah, when I start seeing him as a menace, you know, <laughs> usually because the baby's real close. Um, but it's not the first time he goes through this, and I'm a childbirth educator, so when I started growling at him, he was smart enough to move behind me <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't see him. Um, and all of a sudden my waters never break when I give birth. I've always given birth in call. Oh, what? So, really? Yeah. With the amniotic sac around the babies. That's like um, very, very rare to have it with every pregnancy. That's insane. It, it's, it's very rare in a hospital or even with midwives, but when you're having a hands, uh, hands off birth or a free birth, it's a lot more common. Oh, Okay. And so I had had two hands off. So nobody had ever, you know, done cervical checks on me. Um, I had never been laying uh, in bed. And I have an inkling that if you're in the water, perhaps it relieves some of the gravitational pressure on the bags of water. And perhaps that's why we see a little bit more uh, of in-call births in, in water. But all to say that I had never actually experienced my waters breaking. And um, I'm in the tub and all of a sudden I feel this huge pressure um, in my bum. <laughs> and I looked at my husband and I said, oh, no, I need to go to the bathroom. And in all, all his glory, he picks up a fishnet and he looks at me. And he says, it's fine. I'm ready. Stay in the tub. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and I looked at him and I said, no, no, sweetie, I think this is going to be liquid. I, I can't stay in the tub. I have to, I have to get out. So he grabs the bowl that we have for the placenta <laughs> and he holds it up and he says, it's all good, sweetie. I, I have this. <laughs> and he goes and he lifts my bum up out of the water and puts this giant metal bowl under my butt for me to do my business, you know, <laughs> in the tub. And I was going to protest and, and get out of the bath to go to the bathroom. But then a contraction hit so hard. There was no way of, of holding anything. And pop, I look in the water and I realize it's actually my water. Oh, I thought you were going to say the broken. baby. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> No, no, it was my water. So we both started laughing, you know, because we were both extremely, extremely relieved. <laughs> so water and not, you know, full blown diarrhea everywhere. Um, so that was, you know, fantastic. <laughs> my first experience and my cervix actually dilated. Uh, whatever was left to be dilated, dilate, uh, dilated in one shot when my waters broke because I actually had um, a few blood clots come out at the same time because the cervix basically popped out of place in, in, in one hit, um, which happens, but not super frequently. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like minutes later, uh, I started having, you know, when you're having a contraction, your baby is, is actually passing through your cervix. Women will tend to uh, growl or moan, but at the end of the contraction, they'll go uh, like this, you know, just at the end. Um, I started doing that. So I knew that, you know, the baby was descending and gosh, within minutes, his head came out really, really fast. Um, and I suddenly, I've given birth hands-free, but I always had a midwife there. So I was not responsible for the situation. So I was always kind of um, not in the same world. And so one of my biggest fear with a free birth was to be not conscious enough to realize if th something is wrong and use my knowledge and rationality to intervene properly. That was my fear. Um, but in this instance, probably because there was no midwife and it was all on me, um, even though I was kind of out of this world during the contractions, I was also able to evaluate the situation really clearly. And when his head came out, I felt everything inside of me and I could feel his shoulder that was hitting one of my, uh, pubic bones. So, uh, somewhere between a sticky shoulder and a shoulder dystocia, we'll never know. But I knew that he was not in a great position and he, his shoulder wouldn't pass. And instead of, of freaking out or being afraid, I had the instinct right away to put my finger, um, to, to trace his head with my hand. And I started feeling his ears and his nose. I realized he didn't have a turtle neck, so his, his neck was out, which is a really good sign when you have a stuck shoulder. And then I also realized that his hand was right by his head, so he came out with a nuchal hand. Oh. And so I thought, okay, so I don't have a turtle neck, so all I need to do first and foremost is change positions to open my pelvic outlet. So I was on all fours at that point, so I switched right up to like a semi-squat, semi-lunge position. And in, I usually wait for FVR, so I, I let my body push by fetal ejection reflex. I don't actually push my babies. But because I could feel that his shoulder was stuck, when the next contraction hit, I pushed as hard as I could. And I literally felt his shoulder that was stuck push against the bone, which popped out the other shoulder, and then he came slithering out, you know, in, 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 in that contraction, um, there was no, you know, delay to wait for, um, another contraction. So he came out and, um, my, I didn't know my husband for him was waiting behind me thinking, because I've always given birth on, on all four. So usually my baby pops out towards the back and he was hoping to catch him. <laughs> so, so he was waiting in a football pose. Um, but <laughs> 
I was in a squat, so baby came out in the front. So I actually grabbed the baby and put him on my chest while my husband was still waiting with his hands in the back, not knowing that the baby came out. <laughs> it's like, where is it? Where'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually took him up and he was perfect. Like he was pink. He was the pinkest baby I have ever had. He had a 10 on 10, uh, 10, 10, 10 APGAR score, which is really good for a water birth because usually your first apgar with a water birth is a little bit lower um and he was super pink and beautiful so i started saying out loud oh my god baby you're so cute you're so cute you're so pink hello hello and my husband finally turned around and and moved to the front he's like wait you gave birth (laughs) (laughs) for him he missed the whole thing um and uh i just i sat in i had the birthing pool that has the uh the little seat inside of it and i just sat there and nursed my baby in the hot water for a little while and i think it was maybe after 20 minutes i decided to get out and i went straight into our bed that was right beside and as i was sitting down i actually took a pk and pushed a little bit and my placenta came out put it in a bowl beside us and then we just we just cuddled and and talked to our new baby and I nursed and we just nobody was there it was just us we just enjoyed the moment and my husband prepared us um, a nice platter of of fruits and nuts and cheeses um, that we had together for energy you know after giving birth and I think it was maybe two and a half hours after giving birth instead of cutting the cord, we decided to burn it with a candle. Um, like the, uh, the natives do just to try a new tradition and maybe a softer approach. I would have liked to maybe try a Lotus birth, but I have two toddlers at home and dogs. So I wasn't feeling it. <laughs> yeah. That may not have been the greatest idea. <laughs> no, exactly. Pack- it's like practicality wise. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm the kind of girl who gets her shirt stuck, you know, on door handles. And I thought, you know, a long cord attached to my baby? Nah, not so much. Um, (laughs) So we went middle ground. We thought, okay, let's try the cute little burn the cord ceremony instead, which was great. Uh, I did not know, however, that it could take up to 15 minutes (laughs) to do. So you don't clamp the cord at all? You just literally burn it? Or do you clamp the, the part closest to the baby? I clamped it closest to the baby, but only two and a half laters later when we were ready to do it. And then when you burn the cord, you, you burn it much further than you would cut it. So to make sure that the heat from the flame isn't anywhere yeah. uh, near your baby. Uh, but I did clamp it just because um, I wanted to make sure that if ever it was too long and I was afraid that it was going to get caught on something, et cetera, I had a clamp on it so that I could cut it. Uh, in the end, I didn't need to do that. And 24 hours later, I just removed the clamp and the portion of the cord that was extending from it came with it. So that was great. But uh, I preferred to put the clamp just in case. I know they have cute little ties that you can buy too um, that are um, more comfortable for the baby than the the plastic clamps. Yeah. Did, so you you, go, you went with the plastic clamps though, obviously. I was, when I ordered, it was really uh, at like in the end of my pregnancy and COVID had hit really hard. And so delays were in shipping were substantial. And where we live, um, things get stuck at a handling center three hours from us for one to two weeks. So I knew wow. there was no way I was going to get it in time. Wow. So you guys really live way out there. Like, yes. Way out. Like, how long does it take you to get to the grocery store? Well, we do have a small grocery store here. So it takes me about 25 minutes to get there, but okay. it's a small grocery store and it's extremely expensive. If I want to go to a, a big store, so like, one of the big stores we have in, in Quebec is called Costco. Then I have to drive three hours to go oh, to it. Geez. But at least you can, you can, you know, get a lot of quantity. If it's anything like the Costco we have, it's like you buy it wholesale and it's in bulk, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like I go every two or three months and I stock up. Oh, okay. You know, it's so nice talking to another nurse about this because I was a little hesitant to get into the whole free birth thing because you hear these horror stories and 
being in labor and delivery, we really we get some pretty scary situations resulting from people who just try to do it at home. But it's it's nice when someone's like well informed and 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 I mean you obviously know what you're dealing with because you're a nurse. But it's just it's so scary to think about it. I I wasn't sure if it was a good idea because I'm like, is this like a legal thing for me or you know what I mean? Like obviously I'm not promoting anything, but I just like to hear everybody's take on it in their experience. Um, I think with with free birth, you know, one of the issues with it is I'm in a lot of free birth uh, groups on Facebook, and there's this very dangerous train of thought that is being circulated within these groups by some women where they go to the extreme of believing that uh, birth is natural is and is instinctual to the degree that you shouldn't even prepare for it. Right, like no prenatal care, anything like that. No prenatal care, no education surrounding birth, not asking questions and knowing how to intervene in in circumstances. Like everybody going into a free birth or giving birth should know what a hemorrhage looks like, the first beginning signs of it, so that you can seek uh, help if you need it. Um, You know, being able to recognize that if you're having a sticky shoulder situation, well, there are different positions that you should, you know, try try and and circle through to make more room in your pelvis. Um, Signs in late pregnancy that could, you know, potentially mean preeclampsia, et cetera. I think that birth is a supernatural and safe and beautiful process. In the vast majority of cases, when it's left unhindered, the pregnancy has been healthy and the people that are in the room with the woman um, are confident and knowledgeable in a natural birth and they stay quiet and they sit in a corner and they don't bother her and they let her work through her labor. If you do not intervene, the vast majority of time birth will go off without a hitch. The problem we have is in hospitals, we intervene all the time. We go into the room, we ask questions, so we bother them. We uh, pull them out of um, the state of mind that they need to be in in order to give natural childbirth, and we force them into rational thinking, which increases pain. We make them lay in bed for 30 minutes so that we can do a fetal monitoring, which increases pain. We make them lie in bed to give birth, which decreases the pelvic outlet by 30%, etc. cetera. So we do yeah. so many things that, that cause problems in birth. However, even in in an unhindered birth, there is a a possibility and it will happen and it does happen that something does not go according to plan. And you need to, in my opinion, know about these things, take full responsibility for these things and know how to intervene early on in case there is something, you know, that does happen. I think that a lot of people say that if you prepare for it, then you're kind of inviting it in, it in. But the way I see it, if you give, you know, birth naturally, if you have a free birth without being prepared, it's almost equivalent to um, driving 200 kilometers an hour on a mo- motorcycle without a helmet. Right. It's like I when mean, you it's don't just, have car insurance, you're going to get an accident. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, just, you know, standard precautions. Right. I mean, and I think, you know, in today's society, we've been exposed to so many Hollywood representations of dramatic births and what will you, so that although birth is natural, we do kind of have to educate ourselves. We have to decondition ourselves from thinking that birth is this dramatic thing. And we also need to accept that Sometimes pregnancy does get complicated and sometimes that means birth will need medical assistance. And sometimes if you plan a free birth, but then in your free birth, you realize that something's not quite right. It's okay to seek help at that point if you're not feeling it anymore. So in my opinion, free birth is not giving, you know, birth alone at home at all costs. It's having the freedom to choose where you give birth with whom you free you you choose to give birth and having the freedom to change your mind whenever you want. Right. A great point. 
you said you don't allow them to push on your uterus, like massage your fundus or anything like that um, after your births. Is I know the more births you have, the higher risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Do you do your own bundle massages if your bleeding picks up or like, how does that whole thing work? Well, the idea that you have more risk of postpartum hemorrhage, um, the more babies you have is based on, um, uterine, adeny, adeny, uterine adeny, uh, where, um, basically your uterus would become so lazy that, um, it wouldn't be able to contract down hard and fast enough to close the wound from where your placenta detached. Um, one of the advantages of, of having a free birth and to birth your own placenta is, um, generally speaking, the room is warm, the lights are dimmed and it's a very oxytocin filled room, which tends to promote better postpartum, uh, contractions. I also don't just sit around waiting for my placenta. I will use gravity and I will get into a position that optimizes, uh, its release as well. And I nurse within 10 minutes of giving birth, which helps have uh, a lot of u- uterine contractions, but it's a case by case situation. In my case, my after pain, so the contractions after I've given birth are the most horrendous after pains anyone I've ever worked with has ever seen. They're extremely, extremely, extremely strong. So I have the extreme opposite of a lazy uterus. My uterus is is like on steroids after giving birth. So um, unfortunately, that means a lot of pain, but fortunately, it means a very small risk of me right. having a postpartum hemorrhage. However, were that to happen, um, I did have mother tinctures with me that contract the uterus in case, and I would have performed um, a massage on my uterus if I felt it was necessary. My husband knows how to do one as well, if that had been necessary. Obviously, if we would have gotten to the stage of needing to do a uterine massage because I felt that I was at risk of having a postpartum hemorrhage, I would have went in for assistance, you know, just in case. Um, but, uh, my, my postpartum bleeding was, was just fine, but it's, it's the, the, what I don't like is when you're giving birth in the hospital, for example, when I attend birth in the hospital is, um, regardless of whether there's a hemorrhage or not, we, we do the same thing every time, you know, we pull on the cord, we push on the fundus, we pull the placenta out, oftentimes resulting in a placenta that's you know, damage or broken in pieces. And then we have to examine it to make sure we have all the pieces and we're not taking a risk of, of a retained piece that causes hemorrhage. Um, and we automatically then start massaging her uterus, which is just super painful when you just gave birth and we give, you know, a Pitocin shot right after just in case. And are there situations where this is helpful? Absolutely. Should we be doing that to all women when they gave birth, regardless of the risk or of the signs of a hemorrhage? Absolutely not, in my opinion. It's like uh, going and and running um, a marathon over three days and every single muscle in your body hurts. And then somebody comes along and says, okay, now I'm going to like punch you in the legs where it hurts the most repeatedly. Of course, it's going to (laughs) hurt. You wouldn't believe, so where I work, it's the, it's my first, I've been a nurse for 11 years, but it's my first labor and delivery job. I've been here almost two years. Um, every patient that comes through, unless they refuse, which I haven't had one yet, um, as soon as the placenta delivers, hairs are repaired, we have to rub their, massage their funders every 15 minutes for two hours straight. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So, and it doesn't stop there. After that, we wait an hour. We massage it again. We wait four hours, massage it again. And then it's once per shift if they're still admitted. It's, I feel like it's so excessive. And I mean, that's what we're taught. You know, that's what we have to do per the protocol. And sometimes I just feel like I'm torturing them. And, you know, as long as their bleeding is well controlled, I'm not, you know, really digging in there. But, you know, they have a condition to think that, if we don't do this, they will, they will bleed too much or they're going to retain a clot. And it's just, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a it's lot. It's crazy. I mean, if you, if you get a, a chance of, of 
and people who are listening, if you have a chance uh, of reading books by Michel Audin, which is a French obstetrician who writes a lot about birth, um, one of the things that he explains is the most important thing in preventing a postpartum hemorrhage is not massaging. It's not Pitocin. It's not, you know, getting the uh, placenta out quick and fast. It's oxytocin. If you promote the release of oxytocin, which is the love hormone, if you will, um, after birth, it causes contractions in the uterus because it is the hormone that's responsible for you giving birth in the first place and will prevent hemorrhage in most cases. So if instead of touching the woman and asking her questions and hurting her, et cetera, you dim the lights, you make sure the room is warm enough and you take a step back and you let her look at her baby, which makes her oxytocin like skyrocket. You encourage her to nurse um, early on. And even if she plans to formula feed, you can explain how at least letting the baby, you know, use the breast as a pacifier for the first 24 hours or so can be helpful in preventing hemorrhage, et cetera. And you let her and her husband, you know, or wife um, gush over the baby, et cetera. The natural release of oxytocin in most cases is is much more efficient than, than doing fundal massages. But if we're coming in every 15 minutes and pressing down on a sore uterus and, and pushing and, and pushing and pushing, I mean, we're just stealing all of the oxytocin out and we're effectively increasing the chance of a hemorrhage. So at that point, the fundal massages become necessary. Yeah. And that's, that's a hundred percent. Like I, I can see that now as you say that, because every time like they're trying to breastfeed, I'm like, sorry, you're going to put your head down so I can rub your belly. And I'm like, and you're, like you said, you're breaking up that, that, that moment. So you're, you're stopping the oxytocin. And not only that, not only are we rubbing them, we're infusing a liter of Pitocin and then we're running it like 125 oh, an hour for, for seven hours. So, Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's, Oof. I know, I know. I mean, after I had my kids, I, but I think I maybe have the same issue as you where it's intense, intense contractions to shrink my, my um, uterus down. And I also have huge, huge babies. I mean, my biggest was 11, 12. Um, <laughs> and it, it hurts. I mean, the, the bigger it is, the more shrinking it has to do. And it hurts a lot. Like, I don't need any extra help. You know, no, with the pain. exactly. When you have, you know, um, postpartum contractions or after pains, if you want, that are that intense, like you and I have. To give us Pitocin, I mean, I didn't take an epidural to give birth, but if you give me Pitocin after I've given birth with the contractions I already have, I will take an epidural. Right. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I mean, when you're having contractions to give birth, it's like you get a big gift in the end. It's worth it. But after birth, there is no gift at the end. <laughs> I'm not interested. Right. <laughs> I know we touched a little bit on your business. Let's why don't we get into that? I know it's you do a lot of awesome, interesting things. So I didn't hear about it. Well, um, the way I got into this business is actually when I when I finished my first degree in nursing and I went into my second degree, it was more of a, a research fo uh, focused second degree, and I fell into uh, epidemiology, which is um, how our environment will affect our gene expression. And so the possibility of chronic diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And that ultimately leads into maternal health during pregnancy and the first few months to a year after birth and even three years, which we call primal health, uh, because we do the most of our learning um, in the first three years of our life. And so I started doing a lot of research in those areas, et cetera, um, and it made me realize just how important uh, pregnancy health is, how you give birth and how you are given birth to, um, and the kind of support that mothers have in the first three years postpartum because it will have a huge impact on her, on the family life, and the child as he or she 
uh, grows up as well. It has long lasting effects. And when I was doing my bachelor's, I actually became pregnant with my first son. And uh, I started looking around and I realized that we just, we don't have a lot of resources. And if you want to hire a breastfeeding consultant, uh, most of the time they're not healthcare professionals. They're just, um, anybody can become a breastfeeding consultant by doing a course online. Uh, anybody can become a sleep training consultant by doing a course online. Um, anybody can give, you know, prenatal classes um, in person or online, whatever, by doing a certificate. Like there's a certificate for everything these days. And being a nurse myself, I wasn't super comfortable with hiring someone for breastfeeding, et cetera, et cetera, that wasn't a healthcare professional, which is strange to hear me say as I've chosen to free birth, but there are some instances where I, I just, I do prefer to, to have the expertise of a, a healthcare professional. And um, I thought to myself, then you have these situations where you have the breastfeeding consultant that is contradicting your sleep consultant and your sleep consultant is contradicting your breastfeeding consultant and your right. pregnancy care doctor is contradicting what your childbirth educator is telling you, etc. So you're stuck in the middle and everybody's saying different things. You're paying a whole bunch of different people exorbitant prices. And in the end, you're just as confused as you ever were so you jump onto mom groups and you ask questions but then the answers you get are well intentioned but they're still all over the place again um and some of them may not be super safe recommendations etc um and i thought wouldn't it be nice if mothers had access to a one-stop place to have peace of mind in their parenting like no matter what it is that they're going through they could talk to a nurse right there and on the spot and get the help that they need with proper support. And so anyways, from there on came all the training and the education and the certificates and what have you, uh, and research into sleep and fertility and pregnancy care, um, childbirth education, et cetera. And, um, the baby was born. So the way that we work is, um, we do one-on-one -on -one consults. We create customized, tailored plans. We do not give handouts. Everything is done by hand for that specific client in respect of their uh, educated choices. Uh, but I, I do mark educated choices. Um, <laughs> and then we have an, uh, other consults to go through the plans. We walk them through whatever it is we're doing. So if we're doing sleep training, for example, they'll get a customized plan. Um, we'll explain how to apply it. We'll explain the day-to-day -day portion. And then from then on, the really cool thing is we have an instant messaging app. And our clients have access to us for a minimum of three months, depending on which program they have. And they have unlimited instant messaging between them and their nurse on a daily basis so that they can ask questions, seek guidance. Uh, the nurse can check in and make sure that we're making the progress that we should be, um, ask questions. We have phone calls to make sure that we're not stalling progress or make changes in the program if we need to. And before we're done, that once the baby is, for example, sleep trained, sleeping through the night 12 hours, taking really good naps, um, when age appropriate, of course, we also have another consult where we explain every single sleep progression, nap change, bedtime change that will occur in the first three years. Um, and we also tell them when and how to drop a nap. Um, and when and how to transfer to a big kid bed as well if, if we're not dealing with a toddler that is already in a big kid bed. The, the goal being that by the time that the person um, is done with our program, whether that be breastfeeding or sleep training or childbirth education, they have all of the information that they need that they never need us again. Of course, if they have a question in the future, we're always happy to hear from them and we're always available. But the goal is for them to not have to um, 
pay again in six months from now because their child is going through a sleep regression and they're not sure how to handle it. Everything is done and included. And so the power, the, the parent becomes very empowered and knowledgeable and they can take, you know, the sleep or the breastfeeding or th this or that into their own hands. They know what they're doing by the time that we lock off. And we do offer, a lot of our clients choose to uh, have long-term support and so long-term access to our app just because they enjoy having a nurse uh, on call, you know, so if their kids are sick or whatever, um, they can get advice. And um, we offer a lot of support and information in other things such as weaning children when parents want to do that, uh, potty training children, dealing with picky eaters, um, and all that sort of thing. So the, the ones that choose long-term support, uh, it's, it's actually very cheap. And so they, they can have access to their same nurse, always the same nurse on a long-term basis. So the person that they're working with, um, knows them, knows their family, knows their history and is able to give very personalized advice all the time. So basically I've built Be Baby to be that one-stop shop where no matter what is going on in your parenting journey, whether you're trying to start it, you're midway through it, um, or you have five-year-old twins, we can help you. Amazing. What's your specialty? Um, we have uh, four areas of specialty. So uh, fertility uh, counseling, we have two levels. We have like um, basic fertility and then we have the advanced fertility for those who uh, really have diagnosed or need to be diagnosed with uh, severe fertility problems. Um, we have a pregnancy support program that's usually taken uh, by women who've had fertility journeys and who need a lot of support during pregnancy or um, those who have uh, suffered previous losses. Um, and we have a childbirth prenatal program as well as a breastfeeding consultancy and sleep training consultancy. Wow. Okay. So you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes. We also have a program uh, for two under two or three under three, where we help moms um, prepare and adjust for kind of a huge transition. <laughs> Yeah. How many nurses or people do um, work for you? So we have, uh, all of them are on contractual basis, um, depending on their availabilities and um, our client loads, et cetera. Uh, but we have about three nurses that are there. We have a few midwives as well. Um, and we have a few other professionals that will consult on cases as need be. So um, we work with a, a few osteopaths and physiotherapists and uh, discipline experts, et cetera, et cetera, oh, for, wow. for cases where that's necessary. Um, and we're actually working on a phase three that will come in the first half of 2021, where at a reduced fee, Everyone will be able to have access to our full programs in a pre-recorded video format, and they will have access to a online membership where um, they can post requests. Like, for example, I want to. Um, uh, they bought a sleep training program, and they're in our membership, so they can send unlimited emails to their nurse or our team for questions whenever they want. But on a specific week, they post in our community where they share with with other members that they want to potty train their, their child. Well, the next week we will film a mini course on how to potty train your child and it will be released on the membership and it will be available forever on the membership. So we will be creating content and releasing it at the demand of parents, not what we want to release, but what they want us to release. And the admins or um, the, the people that will be uh, monitoring these communities and answering questions will be uh, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, midwives, uh, all kinds of expert professionals, as well as our community of large family mamas. So moms who have six to 12 children uh, of varying ages who can offer a lot of logistical and practical advice at dealing with daily life with a whole bunch of children. Wow. Are your services available to people worldwide or just in Canada or... 
Our services are available uh, worldwide. Um, most of our clientele uh, speaks English um, and is from either the U.S. or Canada, although we do have quite a bit of European clients. Um, we have a few French clients as well, but not as many. Okay, perfect. And also, do you have, I know you have um, a Facebook account. Do you also have Instagram that you want to share? Yes, my Instagram is be baby mom. So that's B E B A B Y mom. It's a new Instagram account though. I'm I'm very new to the Insta game and um, <laughs> very confused about it. So don't touch. Okay. Yeah, same here. I I don't know all the terminology. <laughs> I'm like I'll tag you. I don't, I have no idea. So <laughs> the other day somebody told me, "Oh, drop me your handle." I was like, "What?" <laughs> what? I thought it was a hashtag, but I guess it's a handle. Yeah, I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, so also, if you want to share any pictures from your free birth or your, any of your births, um, send them to me and I'll, I'll post it when I post your your episode, if, if you're okay. okay with that. Yeah, my husband um, had set up the camera and then, um, you know, how men are, he uh, forgot to turn it on. And so I have nothing, but I do have a picture of after with all the kids. So I can send you that. Oh, perfect. That works. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this incredible mom story today. I really hope you enjoyed it and that it may have helped you in some way. Make sure you rate and leave a comment so I can be sure to bring you the content that you really want. Please follow the Incredible Moms podcast on Instagram, where you'll also be able to find many updates and episodes. I can't tell you how much I appreciate any support. Stay tuned for another Incredible Mom next week.